it's important to just remember to keep talking about just because it's working doesn't mean it's right. Just because whatever fundraising method we're using is really effective in raising money, for example, does not mean that it's ethical. Welcome, everyone. I am so excited to be here today with Michelle Shireen Neary. Michelle, welcome to What the Fundraising. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me. I'm excited to be here. I'm so excited for this conversation, and I feel like you need no introduction, but I'm going to let you introduce (laughs) yourself. So just tell everyone a little bit about you, what you do, and what brings you to our conversation today. Yeah, thank you for having me again. I'm known for a few things right now. I am the host of the Ethical Rainmaker podcast, which is entering its fifth season in summer 2023, which I'm really excited about. When I started it, I was hoping maybe like 500 people would listen one time, but it's really exceeded expectations. It's amazing. It's sponsored now by Neon One in part, and it's really grown. On that podcast, we talk about community centrism and we talk about what gets in the way of doing really good work for our communities and how we can deal with it. We cover case studies of things that are going really, really well or things that are terrible, other factors that influence our work culture that are really just getting in the way or can help us with our work from a community-centered perspective. And the Ethical Rainmaker podcast was created by me as part of the community-centric fundraising.org content hub. I am one of the original co-founders. There is a group of eight of us in Seattle who did a bunch of research. We did qualitative research with people of color in fundraising in the Northwest, United States, and we did quantitative analysis of a survey of over 2,100 people across the U.S., Canada, and some other parts of the world, whoever responded. Um, And we learned that folks working in fundraising felt like the way that we traditionally fundraise actually promotes white saviorism and promotes racism and bad practices and, and often damages our communities. So majority of participants in the survey determined that. They also determined that they were willing to do something about it, but we also learned that folks felt really alone. So I'm part of a group of co-founders and was the co-chair for several years with Andrea Arenas and at one point Vule, who's also part of that original eight, uh, the creator of Nonprofit AF. And together we determined from the research that What was really needed is a content hub for people to share out ideas and case studies. And then there were requests, of course, for connection with one another so that we didn't feel so lonely thinking about the way that we want to make change in our organizations. So now this project has grown. We launched in July 2020. In the first two weeks, we went from no mailing list to 20,000 people, and now our mailing list is huge. We have tens of thousands of people check the site for fresh content and use it. I'm getting reports of even the Ethical Rainmaker being used in classrooms, including legal classrooms, which I think is really wild. (laughs) But yeah, the Content Hub has boomed and blossomed and has been really incredible. A Slack community of over 6,000 people now exists that anybody can join, and we see over 100 place-based groups meeting in different cities using that Slack channel to communicate about where and when. And in all of this, I would say before the launch of CCF, I was a fundraising consultant doing a wide range of services. My consultancy is called Freedom Conspiracy. And I work with nonprofits that are working really for the greater good of uh, primarily people of color, but not only, and looking to implement community-centric practices in their work, whatever that means to them. And since that time, I would say about 80% of my work now is public speaking or running workshops. I run a bunch of cohorts as well. All of it kind of centered around how do we really make something more community-centered, coming from wherever the participants are coming from. So that's a little bit about my background. It's been a really crazy, awesome journey. It has been amazing to watch the rise of community-centric fundraising and the community and just how quickly the initial language, the surface level of what the movement was intended to do started to find its way into every nook and cranny of the conversation around fundraising. And I, I just think that's such a testament to the need for it, for the conversation, for the eagerness of fundraisers to do things differently, and for this long time knowing that things have not been right, but not knowing what to do about that. And so I just, I'm so grateful for everything you all have done and put together to catalyze that movement. 
Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for that recognition. It's been incredible. And just for those folks who are listening who are not familiar with community-centric fundraising, it's a few things. Like I described, it's a community-centricfundraising.org as a content hub. It's a community on Slack of thousands of people. But really, it's also a movement that has expanded globally. We're hearing from people all over who are really interested in this work, which is exciting. The rough definition is it's a fundraising movement grounded in equity and social justice, which prioritizes the entire community, kind of the holistic picture, over individual organizations. And as part of that, we believe in recognizing the history, then the racist history that we have, especially in the United States, around how nonprofits and foundations were built, how that money is used, how it's given away, how we don't talk about reparations, having really an analysis. And there are a core set of 11 principles that we use as a guide. Yeah, and we will make sure there are links to everything below so people have a million different pathways in. One of the things that I was really excited to talk with you about is, so I have seen community-centric fundraising come up with clients, with folks inside Power Partners, with questions posed across the internet. And one of the things that I've really noticed in a lot of the questions surrounding how to use community-centric fundraising practices is some fear, some fear of like messing up, some fear of doing it wrong. And in my own personal anti-racism work and white supremacy culture work, perfectionism and dealing with my perfectionism and overcoming perfectionism has been such a central piece. Yeah. And it's it's been so interesting to watch with community-centric fundraising so often the tension that exists between adopting community-centric fundraising practices, but then still falling back on the tendencies of perfectionism when using them. So talk to me about what you've seen there. Oh, man. Well, okay. Thank you. I I love that we're going to talk about this topic today because it's really (laughs) juicy for all of us. No matter what cultural background you come from, you definitely are interfacing with perfectionism, whether it's your own or somebody else's, whether it's in your family of origin or in your workplace culture. So really rich conversation. And I'm seeing it in so many places. I think one thing that I have seen is For organizations that want to move towards a a community-centric model, whether it's fundraising or programs or whatever, they are often, you know, I might get contacted as a consultant to help a group move forward, but I will often find that the client just wants a checkbox solution. They want to check it off and be told that they did it really well and then move on. And that's not how racial justice and social justice and equity work within a workplace. It's a consistent process, right? Not only is that probably an element of white supremacy, but I actually also think that it's part of perfectionistic tendencies of just wanting to complete something (laughs) and have it be done and have it be done well and get pat on the head and move on. So I think that's one of the places that I see it pop up. I've been doing this work with Fleur Larson Facilitation. She's known as a white woman whisperer is one of her (laughs) nicknames. And we've been doing some work with white women specifically because white women are about 84% of the makeup of our sector in terms of staffing, a third sector staffing. And Fleur runs intensives and cohorts for white women. Fleur and I are about to run an eight-month intensive for white women who are committed to anti-racism and want to use their gatekeeping status to make bigger impacts in their organization and in the third sector and really recognize that idea of having power with other people and not power over other people. And the work that we've done, one of them that has come up for me this week, like it happened in a meeting yesterday, it happened with a friend yesterday, like one of the things that comes up is this perfectionism and perfectionistic tendency around time. The obsession with time. But if you're keeping a Hawkeye on the clock and you keep talking about it and you keep obsessing about whether something is running on time or not, whether this fits into the time parameters, whether we have time to have this discussion because we have a deadline of needing to have something done in two months, like we just got to blah, 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 right? There's so much obsession with time as part of perfectionism. And there are a couple different cultural backgrounds we can talk about in terms of the concept of time. But I want to say that when we are obsessed and perfectionistic about time and timeliness and how much time something's going to take us, 
it often gets in the way of real conversations. So for example, it can be as something as simple as facilitation. If the facilitator is obsessed with time and keeps mentioning time, it really distracts everyone, throws them off of the conversation, can't focus, whether that's someone leading a meeting or whatever. It's really hard when someone keeps announcing the thing, gets in the way of the work, also causes other people to have some anxiety and stress who might not otherwise. It's also an obsession with time and combined with immediacy, which is also one of the white supremacy cultural characteristics, needing to do something right away and having the sense of urgency without actually having a real, real reason why it needs to be done at a certain time means that there's often a lot of stress caused over fake deadlines that we self-create, maybe because we're excited. It can come from positive places. Maybe we're excited. Maybe we want to take action. I often think it's out of a response to overwhelm. On the one end of the spectrum of overwhelm, we have going numb, feeling numb. There's so much to do. There's so much to deal with. There's so much I can't control. And, you know, sitting in it frozen. And then the other end is hyperdrive. Let's do everything all at once as fast as we can. And those two things intersecting with this conversation around time definitely comes up. How's it been for you? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I think the reflection on time is actually a really helpful way to show how it manifests and probably bring awareness to something that's happening like every day inside organizations in these tiny ways. For me, it's interesting because when I think about like the elements of white supremacy, one of the things that I think like hits this perfectionist nail or is like in combination with this perfectionist nail is like the binary thinking, the either or. And so I feel like when as community centric fundraising has like been on the rise as a movement, there's this very binary donor centric versus community centric. And what I actually think people have taken that to become, I'm curious what you think about this, is donors versus community. And then when that gets combined with perfectionist tendencies, like what I hear fundraisers saying is like, no, 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 we can't do that because that's going to make the donors feel good. And then that's donor centric. And I'm like, actually, like the community is centered in that whole program in how you're designing everything. And yes, like, and pillar eight of community centric fundraising is that everybody benefits. And so yes, like the right donors being a part of that are also going to feel positive affinity for your organization. But they both can have that experience if you're designing it in this way. But this real like resistance and this deep fear of like, if our donors have an emotional experience that might come across as similar to a donor centric experience, that that like cannot coexist with community-centric fundraising. And to me, that fear is all coming from this combination of different elements of white supremacy culture. Yep. And I'll say this now so boldly, we weren't willing to talk about it before, but the moment that we launched community-centric fundraising, the moment at the Content Hub, and the moment that we started reaching out to kind of other influencers in the sector to tell them what we were about to launch, to ask for their assistance. Vu and I had many phone calls with folks in a variety of places in our sector who had big voices. And we got a lot of silence. We got a lot of silence. But on top of that, we also got hate mail. <laughs> like from some of the most famous people in our sector. And I was so surprised because if you're a fundraiser and if you're a speaker, for example, or an author, et cetera, et cetera. So an influencer I would have expected at least better diplomacy, but we really got a lot of pushback and it's still happening. You know, there are definitely voices that want to fight. It happens often on LinkedIn, for example, you'll see these little spats come up and people respond from all over the place. There was one incident that happened a few months ago where like hundreds of people commented on something that they weren't even at and that there was no context for it. Like, it's really wild. So One of the things that I could share, if it's okay, is just a little bit of the background of what I think being donor-centered is. So one of the things I talk about for background is that we have to recognize that the third sector, nonprofits and foundations, are all part of a political and economic system. And that's not what this pod is about today, but there's a lot of information about that. Part of it is that There's just a lack of awareness and accountability in our system. And we often don't step back. We're right in the middle of all the work 
I know when I was doing immigrant rights work, which is the beginning of my fundraising career, I come from an immigrant family. My family's Iranian American. And it felt so good to be helping in a nonprofit that was serving the immigrant and refugee community. But there were hundreds of people lined up out the door or on the phone often, thousands of people on the phone every week calling for assistance. It's really hard to step back, build an analysis and move on. But if we step back, there are a lot of things that point to the third sector being part of a political and economic system. And that system includes this concept. And this is part of the history of how nonprofits and foundations were created and why they were created, that most of us are grounded in the belief that charity resolves systemic issues, right? Mm -hmm. Which is totally false. There's no way that a nonprofit anywhere can resolve a whole systemic issue when the systems are political and economic, systems like capitalism and sexism and white supremacy and the way the government works, et cetera. There are so many gaps in services to our communities that nonprofits, especially in the 80s, when a lot of protections and network and safety nets were taken away by the government, we saw a rise in nonprofits and this idea that charity should resolve systemic issues. And from that, because charities rely on or nonprofits rely on wealth to fund them, you know, like a spate of foundations, usually who've made their money from extractive practices and continue to invest in extractive practices, and then also individuals, wealthy individuals, the, because we believe that charity will resolve systemic issues, it also ties us to donors and seeking out donors and giving philanthropists power and influence and financial control essentially over other people's lives. We've had nonprofits be dependent on wealthy and honestly predominantly white donors and foundations. And so this idea of donor-centered fundraising as a best practice is actually the practice that builds donor control, builds the idea of saviorism, and is rooted in nonprofits basically like begging for the good graces of a patron and bending to the patron's will to do the thing. But one of the pushbacks that I heard from one of the famous people who reached out to us to spew their displeasure was this idea that like, well, what nonprofit exists that doesn't serve their community? But, you know, Mm -hmm. like through your experiences too, I'm sure you see that a lot of times solutions that are being provided by nonprofits to community issues are not dictated by members of the community, by and for the community. They're dictated maybe by heads of corporations in a sterile boardroom. Like they're dictated by folks that the nonprofits wants to have closer relationships with for fundraising purposes. They're dictated by a donor, a particular donor themselves, for example. I really want to see this as a solution. Please implement Here's the money, but I only believe in the solutions. So that is also donor-centered fundraising. That's a surprising remark because I feel like we have all seen examples of exactly what you're talking about. I mean, I remember my first fundraising gala where the youth in a program were presenting on what they had learned throughout the year. and the parents of the students were not invited to the gala. And I was so angry. (laughs) And I, I thought, there's no way. I thought, oh, this must be a mistake. There must be like a different way to do invitations or I I just like could not believe that this was just going to be okay that the parents of all these students who were presenting in front of hundreds and hundreds of donors and on this huge stage and raising millions of dollars for the organization that the parents of those kids were not getting tickets to the event and I think those types of practices are very common. One of the things that I think community-centric fundraising has done, I think even in my own kind of learning and evolutions, I think one of the ways that has been kind of like justified inside nonprofits is that they just remove their fundraising from the services. You know, they're like, the work is over here. And then everything we do to power the work is a necessary evil, but they're two different things. And I think what you guys continue to demonstrate and to prove is they are not two different things. And the engine and the way that money moves into the organization is a part of everything and influences everything. And so I just think that feedback is a little bit mind boggling to me. (laughs) It is. Yeah, it's really wild. You know, I think another reason 
that fundraising becomes isolated from everything else. I think that's the unhealthiest way, by the way, to structure an org. Let it be heard by everyone listening here who has influence over that. I think that we isolate our fundraisers in part because most of us are pretty uncomfortable with fundraising. Most folks are uncomfortable. Part of the discomfort is because there might be some analysis about how extractive fundraising can feel or how crappy, or there might be examples. I mean, on my podcast, The Ethical Rainmaker, I've done a couple of episodes where I'm just talking about all the ways in which I've made mistakes and used extractive practices and seen success. But because it's successful doesn't mean it's right, which is another point of CCF. So one of the things that we do when we isolate our fundraisers is we are almost asking them to make decisions, value judgments and decisions for the organization by themselves. And I think that it's often because those discussions would be really difficult. For example, do we work with the government? If we're a legal services organization, for example, and our clients are being served by grant money from the government, but the government is also part of the oppression our clients are facing, do we take the money or not? There are two legal aid organizations in Seattle where I live that had these discussions with staff. And one decided to take the money anyway, because whatever, like, let's just take all the money that we can and do the best service that we can. And we will recognize that the government is the primary issue here, the way that it runs, the systems, the rules, and the oppression that's happening by the government is here, and we'll take that money and fight them. The other organization decided absolutely under no condition will we take this money from the government who is part of building this system. In that case, it was the prison industrial system. And what will we do instead? Well, they might lose some money and they might gain some more money somewhere else. Another one of the big fears is about community-centric fundraising. If I use ethics in my decision-making around money, will I be punished for it financially? And, you know, we have to have faith that our communities will step up and do the right thing and that the people who are aligned with you and are being authentic in their philanthropy, et cetera, like will power your work. Um, But I think that fundraisers are often left alone to make decisions about whether they want to work with a corporation that is taking advantage of the community, whether they want to take that government funding, et cetera. Those decisions often don't see the light of day. And part of that is because we structure our nonprofits for fundraising to be so separate so that it can still be considered the necessary evil and everyone else can feel really great about their programmatic work while letting the fundraisers handle the emotional and psychological burden of this work. That is such a good point. I'm sure you've seen this in the CCF community that so often the fundraisers that are feeling very aligned with CCF values and principles Maybe one person in a shop where they don't have the leadership support or even team support necessarily to change their fundraising practices because of what you were mentioning before, just like the fear and what happens if and just like the fear of losing money kind of prevailing over everything. I'm curious, like looping back to that, like perfectionist piece, I think this is another place where fundraisers are feeling very binary. And it's like leading to this like overwhelm and this burnout and just this constant sort of tension and they feel stuck between like, I'm having to participate in this system that now all of a sudden I've realized is very dangerous. How can they like make one degree shifts or start to feel like they're making progress towards community-centric fundraising practices, even if they can't like 180 their organization by the end of this podcast. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Well, so here's the thing, like everything about the way that our nonprofits have been constructed should be questioned, right? For example, again, back to the board example, why do we have a board? There's a legal requirement in this country, so we have to have a board, but how many people are totally necessary? What kind of people should they be? What kind of decisions should they be making? There's an organization in the Rift Valley of Kenya run by Wendo Azed. She's an incredible woman who started this organization when one of her best friends was dying of HIV and AIDS. And she decided to create services that the community actually needed, right? And it started with that. And then there was, okay, so now we have education around this. That means we also need sexual education in the classroom. So let's create that program. Now that means that people have more awareness. Kids have awareness. Young people have awareness. They actually need supplies. So we need a clinic. 
let's build one. And everything that they've done at Dandelion Africa has been through consensus uh, using a board model where the whole community, there are representatives from every part of the community and they make decisions for the community by the community. They are not a board filled with wealthy folks or corporate leaders. They are a board that is solely made from the community so that decisions can be made that really serve like from the vision of the people who are also being served. I mention that because if you're the only person in your organization and nobody is open to the question, then you may want to reconsider where you're working, truly. But we often have more power and more influence than we think that we do. Many of us, in fact, I think there's a lot of messaging in media that tells us that we don't have power and we don't have influence. And it's not true. We have to look at where we do have power and influence and figure out where we can have the conversation. When I run workshops around how do we take a idealistic principle into action? I usually take a poll. I have people review the principles and I take a poll, which of these principles seems the most difficult? And then we dive into the one that's chosen. And I would say at least 50% of the time, maybe more, it used to be all the time, but now it's about 50% of the time, it's principle six, which is about having difficult conversations and being transparent. And the way that we wrote it for community-centric fundraising principles was about donors in that relationship. But what I'm really finding is that people are struggling being honest within their own internal workplaces. So the difficult conversations they need to have when we start generating solutions. Okay, if you could, you know, using a liberating structure called 15% solutions, which we can also link to, without any more resources, power, authority, what are some small steps you can make to create big change? Or are there some big things you can do? I'll often have people populate a list. And so often it's that there's one person they really need to talk to. We really have one person who's actually in the way. It's like the board president or the DD or the finance director. You know, like there's someone that is there that is concerned and blocking everyone else that's interested, but hesitant because they have this loud voice that's blocking movement. So I guess I would recommend assessing where you're at, how much energy you have, and where do you have power to make changes? Once you have an idea, then you can move forward from there. But often it looks like education. I get brought in often to do CCF 101 for board and staff and then build on it and talk about community-centric fundraising and then build on that and maybe do some community mapping of who really is your community and who do you want to prioritize communications work and all of that. There's one of the ideas that folks who aren't really paying attention to community-centric fundraising and are just like flat against it is that it means that we're not communicating with donors. It actually means that we're communicating a lot more with our entire community, that we're more thoughtful and more inclusive and more holistic in our thinking, and that we're communicating a lot more ideally. That's a piece too. So there are some places that you can start. There's some headway you can make by yourself. And then the rest of it is like, what do you need to do? How much energy do you have to move it, move the dial at your organization? And there are lots of steps you can take. Do you guys have any strategies or things you've talked about? I think it's important to sort of acknowledge that like you might lose people and donors along the way of this journey. And yes. I think every organization needs to figure out risk mitigation in a way that they can handle without complete shutdown. And I actually don't mean complete organization shutdown, because I think sometimes organizations need shutdown, but I mean, complete yes. personal shutdown and paralysis. Like, I love what you said about check your energy and like your ability to move forward with different things. But I also think like there does need to be these sort of like open eyes that like this does not mean that everybody who is once aligned with your organization is going to continue to be aligned with your organization if you make these changes. Do you guys have ways that you talk about in CCF helping fundraising teams or organizations deal with that, not from a monetary perspective, but just from a sheer discomfort perspective? Like I'm thinking right. about how all of this work requires a certain level of tools around dealing with the discomfort that comes with venturing into the unknown. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So I think for people who are within an organization and they really want to move it forward, but they're facing the fear of folks, usually it's board members, sometimes it's the ED, but wherever that fear is, it's important to just remember to keep talking about just because it's working doesn't mean it's right. Just because whatever fundraising method we're using is really effective in raising money, for example, does not mean that it's ethical. If we're 
practicing unethical ways of being, don't we want to change that regardless of the cost? Or do we want to keep violating our own values and morality and sense of right by doing things in a way that works? But herein lies part of the diversity and part of the either or thinking issue is that there were a group of eight of us that are the original co-founders of the content hub. Community-centric fundraising has been around for a long time, known as a lot of different things in different cultures. So we didn't like invent it. But this new iteration, this new fire that's been added has been from this effort. And even in that group, even though we were a group of folks who had a lot of identities in common, all of us were folks of color. Most of us were queer, at least half of us were queer. And we didn't have a lot of trouble coming to decisions about the actions we were going to take together, right? There wasn't a lot of hard debate just really light debate about certain topics. And the one place in which we disagreed, and it didn't really matter that we disagreed, was who do you take money from? And on one side, you might have someone who says, I want to take whatever money is out there, regardless of where it came from, because I'm going to funnel it back into our communities and the community that I care about. And I really don't care where it came from or what the ethics are. And I'll jump through whatever hoop and give them whatever report they're looking for. I just need this money to do my work. And I don't care. I don't care what ethics that violates because in the end, what I want to do is serve the most people, et cetera. Then on the other end, you have folks who are very against taking money that comes from unethical practices. Most money comes from unethical practices. Most money comes from extraction. Edgar Villanueva, who was my first client when I became a consultant, which was really exciting. We worked together and traveled together for a year and a half. It was an amazing ride. And one of his determining factors in a hard conversation we were having about a funding, a potential funding partner is, well, okay, it may not be either or they're using terrible practices, but are they open to having a conversation about it? And can I sway them? So Edgar in that conversation saw his own power, recognized that he has power and autonomy and can make movement and inquired about whether he could make movement around, for example, Wells Fargo's interest in funding the work when they were also supporting the pipeline. And Edgar is a queer indigenous man from Lumbee, North Carolina. And so that decision was no, no, we don't need that money if they're not open to conversation, if they're not open to changing their ways, we don't need to take their money. I also saw another example in that work where We worked with an indigenous organization in Canada, and they had a funder who wanted to fund a speaking tour for Edgar in Canada. And that native org decided to say, we'll take the money, but we won't give you any recognition because you oppress our communities. And that funder said, yeah, okay, and gave the money anyway. There are a lot of ways to have this conversation. I think personally, I also land where Edgar landed, which is, do you have the power to make any change in the conversation of the folks who are still causing damage and also want to fund? Or are you just going to charity wash their name and their practices? Because when you do partner with organizations, foundations, or corporations, they're using terrible practices. Well, you're giving them a better image in the public's eye and they're going to use it. They're going to take that photo and paste it everywhere and that award and whatever. And we've been doing that kind of BS for a long time in our nonprofits. We've been allowing folks that are doing terrible things to get wonderful recognition. I mean, think about the Sackler family. I have family members who are affected by their nonsense in the world of the opioid crisis and the creation of it, et cetera. And they had, you know, how many things did they fund with that money? And were those organizations having these conversations? Where is the money coming from? How much damage is it causing in our community? Yeah, it's a big one to have. But folks are really struggling with having those honest conversations inside of their nonprofits with one another. I love the call to action around sort of figuring out your position of power. And instead of thinking like binary, like I either need to be able to change everything at once, or this is good or bad saying like, what would make it feel okay to work with this partner or send out this email or participate in this campaign? It doesn't have to be like, all of a sudden you have rewritten everything when your boss is pushing back, but you've figured out what you can do from your positionality to make it feel more in alignment with how you're trying to show up as a fundraiser. That's right. And then for everyone who's dealing with the fear that is being promoted, we already live in a culture of fear. And then there's so much fear and scarcity 
and scarcity mindset around money. The truth is we live in the US and some orgs have more access to money than others, but there's a lot of, for example, in Seattle, it's like the city of Panem. Like there's so much money here. It's practically raining from the sky for nonprofit work and for good work and for experimental things, et cetera. It's wild. And if you need a starting place, it's really important to learn a little bit about history. Christina Shimizu and I, on my podcast, The Ethical Rainmaker, did two episodes about the racist roots of nonprofits and philanthropy. But you can also see justice funders over in Oakland created a timeline of the way that financial tools of control and power were created and when and why. Rachel D'Souza Siebert and I will be talking at the We Give Summit a little bit about the history of the racist practices and the history of mutual aid, et cetera. But there are a lot of places. I, I actually also give that talk often around the deeper history around how we exist. Because when you do that work, when you just pay attention for a couple of hours and do some research by yourself or by listening to something or using some resource, you can easily see the dots connect around why the way that we've been doing things is messed up and wrong and why we should be changing. And I think that can provide the inspiration to help you find the way to talk to other folks about it. Okay. Yeah. I really appreciate that. And I want to sort of like tie this together with something I've been thinking about, wondering about a lot, which is the practice of gratitude. Because I've seen language over the years about how thanking donors can be very donor centric. And sometimes I think I've seen that type of advice in I don't like to use the word clickbait, but I don't have another like term Do to it. use. But so like, click you know, bait. very like clickbaity ways as opposed to, and I think like at the end, what's at the root of some of those messages is that a lot of the ways we have historically shown gratitude to donors or thank donors have led into white savior complexes, heroism, like all of that stuff. But I do believe, and I'm curious what you think, that there are ways to show gratitude that are genuine and human connection and community centric and are aligned around, like, we're grateful that you're a part of this with us, that you believe in this and that you've decided to help build this with us that are both positive from the impact of like the behavioral science that we know about what makes people feel in connection to something. So it's good for retention and it's good for all those things. And it's not like falling into those old school traps of just like placating the donor and making them feel so good at the expense of how they are representing or talking about or appreciating the community. What do you think about that? Yeah, you know, I know there are a bunch of different opinions. I know that Vu wrote contentious blog post about thanking folks. You know, one of the things he talks about is there are different ways to thank people. And he talks about in his culture, he's Vietnamese, and in his culture, you thank folks with gifts of food, for example. But I don't think he was ever saying, don't thank your people. But we also know that especially if you're a shop of one or a shop of two, especially if you go through, for example, a crisis where suddenly you have a lot of donors, where are you going to get that time to write every single thank you note or to send a thank you letter, even if it's a form letter, like that takes a long time both to develop the content and to format it and send it. And it's a lot of time and resources. And I think that's the actual pushback against thank you letters or thank you cards and that type of gratitude. And my opinion is that because we are living in a capitalist society and capitalism is all about extracting things from people for benefit. We are often extracting labor from our nonprofit workers, for example, based out of their love for the and passion for the mission and take advantage of you're going to write a hundred thank you letters. I guess you're going to have to stay late and get it done and do it in a timely manner, drop everything again around the sense of urgency, the stuff that we see around how quickly we need to thank people. I think that is unrealistic and problematic. I know it's the best practice, but again, around sense of urgency and perfectionism, like how much does your donor care if you give it to them in two weeks rather than in 48 hours? I think we got to check ourselves and check the expectations of our donors. But also as part of being in an extractive society, we as donors, as people who donate are often feeling extracted from when we aren't recognized and thanked because we also know that while folks who give on the higher end of the spectrum may sometimes make ridiculous requests, actually will often <laughs> make ridiculous requests, like 
they gave a donation, but they also want to be, oh, what we saw during COVID. Oh my goodness. There was a hospital out here in Bellevue, Washington, where we learned that the major gifts officer or maybe the DD at this hospital gave the wealthiest donors priority to have the first vaccines. That's the kind of power. And it didn't only happen here, but that was one of the news stories. That will happen in smaller ways at different organizations or like someone's name on a building, et cetera, right? Like it can run the gamut. But for the majority of donors who are not at the highest of levels, but who are on other places in the spectrum, they're working hard for that money. Most donors don't actually have a lot of money and they're giving what they can and they're giving more generously percentage wise than folks who have a lot more money. And they're not getting the same benefits because maybe no one should get some of those benefits, right? They're not getting the same benefits, but they are still giving what is significant to them and it's making a huge difference for them in their lives. So yes, I think we should absolutely thank people because we are living in a culture of extraction and for the hardworking person who has made that money and is generously donating it, we may not need to thank them in 48 hours, whatever the current best practice is. But I think we definitely want to make efforts to authentically think whatever that means and just recognize you use your lifeblood and your life energy to make this money in this society. And then you decide it, which is hard to make a living in. And then you gave it to us so that our community will all rise together. That has to happen. So I think we'll see new best practices. But I think one of the best practices is just making sure that we're communicating a lot more with people about what's happening. Like, I'm a donor for Americans United Against the Separation of Church and State because I got bullied a lot by Christians when I was a kid and into my preteen years really affected my friendships. I'll actually do an episode about it to kick off season five of The Ethical Rainmaker. But I see the ways in which Christian nationalism is really on the rise. And there are some foundations that are funding it that are also very anti-queer that are anti-feminist, that are highly problematic, highly racist, and that's all taking off. But I feel like I'm kept in the loop about what's happening because I'm on the mailing list for Americans United Against the Separation of Church and State. And then I get so much information that I don't really need a personal thank you. And I don't need someone to reach out to me because I am constantly reading the three talking points that I should tell my friends next time I see them or the email that I should forward about the Servant Foundation and how problematic they are. You know, like the things that we should know, like I love being kept in the loop that way. I don't actually need anyone to contact me so we can help people feel included like I feel included by that effort, by communicating. I love that advice. And you're pushing me here a little bit because I'm obsessed with the behavioral science of both fundraisers and donors. And it's like, we do have the science to say that, okay, getting a call within a certain period of time has an impact on the hormones that are released in your brain that cement memory with the organization. But a lot of what we know about this type of research is that sometimes it is a little bit of self-fulfilling prophecies. So you have my word and I'm going to look into what other research exists about non-urgent gratitude practices that have been proven to do that same thing in terms of building identity and belonging. Because I started this a few months ago, but I've been doing these like thankathons where I bring people on Zoom and they make their donor calls together. And I do them for the whole quarter. So people have been, you know, the folks gave months ago and they're still, they're connecting, they're giving updates. They're just having this moment of connection and it's been amazing. And I've never heard from one person that somebody was like, I gave three months ago. You know, it's like people are just excited to connect and hear updates and stuff like that. So I'm going to, I'm going to do some research about that and I'll add those into the show notes too. Yeah, do. I can't wait to see what you find, but also we must remember that we created it. So The research that we created around thinking, well, why do they expect to be thanked, for example? And what have we been teaching? Because as much as the systems are messed up, as much as, you know, money comes from extractive practices, majority of the time, as much, you know, like, as much as we have those big systemic things, what are we in nonprofit fundraising doing to build certain habits among our donor base or our community that allows for this? to happen. Basically, what did we do to train people? Right? What did we do to train folks? 
Yeah. yeah. I was I was in a conversation with Chat GPT the other day about the overhead myth or whatever. And I was pushing it around, you know, why are donors so resistant to overhead and what's some of the behavioral science that supports aversion to overhead, all these different things. And as I was reading it, I mean, there was some really interesting stuff in there, but I was also like, gosh, how much have we trained our donors for all of these things? And we did that, Mallory. We definitely, we did that. (laughs) We created that monster. (laughs) And like, there are some elements that it's like, okay, the human brain is sort of programmed for that. But yeah, we have fed that narrative. And I do believe we have an opportunity and an option to retrain donors around that and to change actually how they identify certain elements of fundraising, even for through a behavioral science lens. Like I think there are ways that we, like you said before, have so much more influence, so much more power than we think in certain situations. And if we can own that, then we can really demonstrate, I think, some shifts in this research too. I do too. I do too. I want to go back to the conversation around perfectionism. I realized that like there are some things that get in the way of being able to be authentic and have real conversations and make change And going back to the earlier part of this conversation around perfectionism, perfectionism also tells us that we can't make a mistake. So when we're having these discussions, when we're trying to make change, when we're working with other people's fears, when we're talking about overhead and how we created it, you know, whatever, Mm. like we often are not having those conversations because we're so afraid of messing up or that someone will have a viewpoint that we didn't consider. And especially because this newest rise in community-centric fundraising and its theories and rhetoric like is still new to many folks. That means that we're experimenting and experimentation is also not smiled upon because usually we're afraid that we don't have enough resources to risk it, which goes back again to the conversation around what if we don't make enough money, which leads people to make the decision of we want to make the money, we don't want to follow our values and what's best for our communities. This fear of scarcity this perfectionism around wanting to make sure that we're saying the right thing and that we're not messing up because what will happen if we mess up? And that also leads to a need for mindful practices and repair. The Behaviorist is a podcast that I've come across pretty recently by Work Wisdom. Sarah and Kedrin, they're like a lesbian power couple over in Pennsylvania. And they're doing amazing work around mindfulness in the workplace and all the versions of it, including a lot about consent within the workplace. What do our relationships look like and how do we foster them? And I think part of that is to demonstrate what trust building can look like with one another so that we can make mistakes, so that we can show up and feel free to be our full selves, including if you look like a fool, like, How do we make that okay and make it okay for folks to like be whatever way and experiment with whatever and then be able to talk about it when it doesn't work out? So I think we have in that arena of perfectionism, I think all of these things are related. And when we're worried about that, if I'm worried the whole time that I'm talking to you that I'm going to say the wrong thing, then I actually can't listen to you either. So I'm stuck in my own head worrying about what I'm going to say to you or like, what if I say the wrong thing, but I actually can't hear what you're saying. And we do that with our communities as well. Like we're not listening, we're not engaging, we're not listening. And instead we're dictating and we're trying to dictate the thing that we won't take crap for because we're stuck in our own heads and we can't listen. And then we also do this other thing, two other things that we do. We set examples like, My mom is a really beautiful woman. When we were all kids, we would just be like in awe of her beauty. People would flirt with her everywhere she went and would talk to her and always be attracted to her. But at home, we knew what parts of her body she was uncomfortable with or she thought were gross. And so that kind of perfectionism, for example, taking it into the body image realm and the body realm. Well, if you are gorgeous walking around doing whatever and like she was being her charming, nurturing, amazing, beautiful self, but she also hates pieces of herself. Well, I'm going to learn as a friend or as a daughter, I'm going to learn that it's not okay for me to have those same body parts, for example. It's not okay for me to have like the same flaws that she thought she saw in herself. And we do this, we set bad examples where it's like, oh, no, no, you're beautiful, but I'm not. Look at me. I'm ugly, right? Like, and I think we do this in nonprofits and in our relationship, in our friendships too. Like, I made a mistake. I didn't put a period at the end. I'm so sorry that I, you know, 
I've heard people say crazy nonsense like that in meetings of like groups of people where it's like, I'm sorry, my subject line wasn't very clear and I didn't use it, you know, and I used exclamation point. I now recognize that, you know, like, and it's like, wow, like you're taking up space, obsessed with being perfect. And then you're also making sure unintentionally that everyone in this meeting is going to have to watch how they write their subject lines or where they put their period or whatever. And it doesn't matter. But when we get too perfectionistic and then we're advertising it, we're magnifying and amplifying it. And so if I'm exhibiting that, then you're going to pick it up from me and you're going to be like a little bit more careful when you interact with me. And that's not what we want. And then when we shit talk each other and trash each other in conversation, like, did you see Mallory's subject line? Right. Like, <laughs> then we're, and she didn't use a period, like whatever the thing is, like we trash each other often and then we enforce the idea that it's not okay to not be perfect. So we just keep perfectionism going and that really gets in the way. I'm so glad you brought up those examples because I think it's a really important Like, I don't want people to leave this conversation and think, okay, I just need to address my perfectionism as it relates to using (laughs) community-centric principles, right? Because it is one of those things where it's like, I mean, I talk about this with judgment all the time because decreasing judgment decreases our black and white binary thinking. But you cannot decrease your judgment of somebody else if you do not decrease your judgment of yourself. Like those go hand in hand. Like you cannot be so mean to yourself all day, every day and think, that you're going to be able to be less judgmental out in the world. It doesn't work like that. And so I love that you shared that because I think it's an important reminder that like doing work around perfectionism or any of the pillars of white supremacy, that you have to be thinking about how those things are popping up in all of the elements of your life. That's right. That's right. How they intersect. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. It's it's a big old world out there of scary things that we can discover (laughs) about ourselves and do better on. And it's easy to be overwhelmed. But what we know is that we need to do better to serve our communities, to acknowledge who the community really is in your topic area, what decisions you want to make around how to move forward, what barriers you have, who can help you identifying resources on how to move forward. You can always look me up, freedom-conspiracy.com, or you can look at the Ethical Rainmaker podcast on Instagram and find a link tree, which we'll link to as well in the notes that shows what I'm facilitating. But I'm often facilitating, like, for example, in May 2023, I'm starting to facilitate a cohort of folks who are interested in moving community-centric principles along and are in the beginning stages and are going to take ideals and take them into action. Or like the white women's cohort that I'm going to facilitate with Flora Larson, where we are actually going to talk about the intersection of white supremacy characteristics in direct relationship to CCF principles. There are spaces like that. And there are also other types of spaces like CCF Austin meets once a month and uses a liberating structure called Troika Consulting, where you go and you take the issue that you're coming up against in your workplace and you workshop it with other people so that you have some solutions that are generated by the community that you're learning to trust. So there are a lot of resources out there to help you on your journey to move towards more community-centric fundraising and make it a little less intimidating to deal with all of the different pieces of ourselves that we have to align and rectify. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I hope this feels freeing to hear and not more overwhelming, but like you are going to mess up. And I think that for me was really freeing. It's like, I remember somebody said, like, they were talking about something completely different, but they were like, how do you, you know, show up so confidently as an expert and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I think the number one way is that I'm not an expert and that I'm pretty sure I'm not the smartest person in the room by like a long shot. And I'm not going to know the answer to every question that's asked of me. And if I tried to go into every single panel or every single conversation like afraid if I didn't know a question I was getting asked, I would live in total paralysis. And instead, it's just like acknowledging that venturing into unknown territory, even in our conversation, I being like, I don't know what you think about this question I'm about yeah. to ask you on a recorded podcast, <laughs> right? right. But, but here, like, I think those are the types of steps forward that we have to take and then know that If we get it wrong, if we cause harm, that's where accountability comes in. I've learned the most in my journey from accountability, probably of all the things. And that's an important part of the process. It's not always going to be comfortable. You're not always going to get it right. But if you're committed to the work, that's a part of it. That's right. And I think ultimately, we all feel better being more authentic and aligned with our values. Totally. 
Thank you so much for this conversation, for swimming into these waters with me, and just for everything that you are doing to move our sector towards a more equitable and just place. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you for the recognition and thank you for all the work that you do as well. I um, love the ways in which you're bringing neurological sciences into <laughs> our practices <laughs> in all the ways and the all the work that you're creating. I have my coloring book for fundraisers that you've just created on my desk with me right now. And yeah, really appreciate you. Thank you so much for having me on the show. 